Hello, and welcome to today's podcast. I'm Susan Guthrie, your host, and today we have a really interesting episode for you all. Um, I was just saying to my lovely guest that this is an episode or a topic that I have posted about a few times in my feed, and it seems to bring up some really deep emotion for people. So let me introduce you to Holly Davis, uh, my, my guest for the day. Holly and I are just meeting and I'm so excited to have her here. So first, let me just start with thank you, Holly, for coming on. You're welcome, Susan. I'm very excited for this podcast today and I'm thankful to be on your show. Thank you. I I have to tell you, I saw the submission come in to talk about this this case and this underlying issue, which I really think is is you know the case is what's getting the headlines, but the issue is what's so fascinating. I think from a legal aspect, um, and your background is perfect for um, having an expert on, which I think is very important when you are talking about these deeply legal issues that are so emotional as well. So let me tell people a little bit about you. You are one of the founding partners of Kirker Davis LLP, and you are in one of my absolute favorite cities of Austin, Texas, um, and Hook'em Horns. I think you guys had a big game this past weekend. Yes, you did. Yeah, yeah. And you're a nationally recognized family law trial attorney. In fact, you have litigated cases, not just of millions, um, but of billions of dollars in family, uh, marital estate assets, et cetera. So you, you know, when you're, when you're litigating at that level, you get into these deep, down, dirty family law issues. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're talking about this intersection of divorce and fraud. And the case that's bringing this all up is one that's been all over the headlines for the past several months. Uh, Major League Baseball player Ben Zobrist and his wife, Juliana, recently went through a trial but there's been, I think, more in the papers than we know. Um, so I'm not, I'm not even going to dive into it. I'm going to let you talk about it. Why don't you give us, just to get us started, a little background on this case? Absolutely. So this case hit the headlines um, really because it has a couple of really you know, salacious details involved. We've got a World Series MVP baseball player in Ben Zobrist. He is married to Juliana Zobrist, uh, his wife of 16 years, and they have three children. She is a Christian singer, self-help author, and wife of a major league uh, baseball player. And what reached the headlines and got this couple into um, our news feeds and on our iPhones is the fact that it came out that Juliana was having an affair with a pastor. And not only was this a pastor of the, the party's church, but it was also a person that was involved in the charity that Ben Zobris had created. And so what we're really seeing unfold in the media and in this divorce trial is the emotions of a husband who felt like he was duped by his wife and a good friend, business partner, and pastor, someone who's providing him, you know, religious counseling as well. Uh, but we also have the intersection of fraud. So Ben Zobrist has, uh, he currently has dropped his lawsuit against the pastor Ben Yon, but he has the right to resubmit it if he wants to, which is something I think that may be on the table. And really we're now talking about what is it that happened that was fraudulent besides having sex with his wife um, in this divorce case. And I think one of the claims is that, um, that, that, that the pastor took money from the charity and that there was fraudulent financial transactions on the part of the wife, Juliana, related to the pastor that Ben is now complaining about. So we've got an affair, we've got um, a church community, we have, you know, $30,000 spent on a retirement party. And we have two very upset parties. We see um, Ben Zobrist and his attorney arguing aggressively in this divorce case, but we also see Juliana and her attorneys arguing aggressively in this case. So that's a bit of the background and we can dive into the particular details, but it has all the makings of a, you know, a people uh, cover story um, and all over our news feeds. Yeah, I have to say, I don't know if it's yet been in people, but I suspect it will be sooner or later. And, you know, so one thing I want to say to the listeners is that much of what is playing out in the media 
is at least from what I've been able to see is coming from Ben personally. He's very vocal about what he thinks happened. And then people's interpretations of the legal pleadings. But I do want to point out, to be fair, Juliana Zobrist has chosen not to participate in the back and forth. Um, she said for the, because she doesn't want that, to put that out there, you know, and, and get the children involved, et cetera. So for whatever that's worth, I do want to say that her voice is not so much being heard as what's coming through the legal pleadings on her behalf. And then, yeah, Ben's been pretty vocal. That's right. And we oftentimes see this in these high profile cases. We've got two messaging platforms occurring at the same time. You've got the legal pleadings. We've got attorneys filing, um, you know, in-depth briefs on both sides in this case, uh, which has been covered in the press as well. And then we have the parties speaking out, or we really have in this case, you're right, Ben, speaking out, um, which I think is sometimes a strategy on the part of a legal team with Ben and his attorney, and sometimes not. I know that when I represent, um, you know, uh, high net worth estates, sometimes it's very difficult to convince your very successful client um, that they need to completely submit to your strategy and, and, and listen. And so as a trial lawyer myself, it's very difficult sometimes to get your client on board. But I think it's very critical because um, I think that judges oftentimes look down on people going to the media and speaking out on the case um, as opposed to letting it all play out in trial. Yeah, that's a great point. And one that I think people, you know, who are reading the details, we live in a society that is absolutely fascinated by every aspect of a celebrity life. And certainly when it comes to celebrity divorces with salacious details, especially like this one, um, they want to hear and under and know every little tiny detail of what's going on, which means that there's a very vocal platform for perhaps a disgruntled or upset person to vent and put their story out there, um, which has made this, I think, even a little more interesting because there's nuance to it that people may not understand. I think that's right. And so what we know is that Ben has been speaking out and been very vocal about his feelings of betrayal. And um, we can see that he is not only feeling that way, but he's acting legally on that betrayal by filing a lawsuit against the pastor. Um, and in addition to that, he, at, at, uh, at their trial, at their eight-day trial in front of a judge, was requesting 60% of the entirety of the marital estate, which is I think between 25 million and 31 million, depending on valuation experts. Um, and so we see that he is not only, you know, vocalizing how he feels emotionally, but he really is acting on that legally. And if I were to pan back as, a, as an analyst of this case or to someone, if, if they were asking me my opinion about Ben's strategy on this, I do think that this case does have the particular facts that would warrant such a, a reaction of betrayal. I, I can also tell you that there are times, obviously adultery um, is a very sensitive topic in divorce. And I'm sure that you've covered that many times. Um, but I think that the level of this adultery is beyond an average case. And the reason why I think that Susan is that this was a person who was trusted to also be in some sense, a marriage counselor to Ben and his wife. And so this is a little bit different than an old high school boyfriend or a, you know, a coworker, um, you know, not that this feels any differently to the party who's you know, being cheated on, right? We can't discount the emotions no matter what, but the level of trust that this pastor had and the religious relationship, I think, between the three people, Ben, his wife, and this pastor makes this type of betrayal a little bit different and more conducive to a fraudulent argument, some sort of fiduciary relationship, even though I don't think one technically did exist between them, but you had an emotional and spiritual connection and a counselor type relationship. Um, so I think that the level to which um, the trust was put in Pastor Yon, I am not surprised. I do not believe it's a disproportionate response by Ben to come out so aggressively in his legal pleadings. Um, and so I'm not very surprised because I think that the, the facts in this case do warrant that type of response. And that's, I think, why we've hooked on to this case. So it is so dramatic. Yeah, and, and such a good point. And I, 
you know, think there that um, it's interesting because later today I'm taping an episode with Dr. Dr. Debbie Silver, who is um, one of the leading experts in betrayal um, and the healing of trust beyond betrayal. So uh, we'll probably be touching on this topic as well. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting in this case, because I think what you just pointed out is there's often a reason to be upset with your spouse for betraying you by having an affair. But in this case, that betrayal is like twofold because for Ben, at least, or it would appear that he had a level of trust and relationship with his pastor as well. And so the betrayal was twofold. Um, but maybe you can dive into, because you mentioned that he had sued the pastor, that lawsuit has now been withdrawn, although without prejudice, so can be refiled. But what bearing does that have, you know, the, the betrayal of trust with the pastor, what bearing does that have on the legal divorce case with Juliana? That's a great question. And one of the things I'm the most excited to talk about here on your podcast, because I think if people were to know more about fraud and how it pertains to divorces, they really could do something about it or just be more aware. So to answer your question, really, it's about the money. And so the reason why we're even talking about a lawsuit um, about, between a husband and a divorce and a pastor is that there were certain financial transactions that occurred at really sensitive times in this divorce, maybe right before the divorce, uh, at critical moments, there was money coming out of the estate, the marriage estate between Ben and Juliana that was going to other people. And Ben is claiming that he was not aware of those payments, did not agree to those payments, or that those transactions were made fraudulently. And so really what we're talking about, when we talk about fraud in the context of divorce, what we're really talking about is money going out uh, of the a state here in Texas, we call that the community state, the marriage state. And it goes to a third party without one of the spouse's consent. And so really there's a lot of different things that play into whether or not someone had consent or agreed to it or should have known about it. What we're also talking about when we're talking about fraud is deception, purposeful um, obfuscation or confusion or just forgetting to tell someone or purposely not telling someone something that you're doing that causes them financial or legal detriment. And so we're not just talking about disagreeing with your spouse shopping at Whole Foods versus your local grocery store. We're talking about tens of thousands of dollars moving away that otherwise would have been sitting there for you to divide up in your divorce. And so when we're talking about the Zobris case, we're looking at the fact that $30,000 was spent by Juliana in the throes of her relationship with Pastor Jan at a time that she admits that she was unfaithful to her husband. She spends $30,000 on a retirement party for this pastor out of the marriage funds, out of you know, joint property held by her and Ben. And in addition to that, there are claims that Pastor Jan took a $3,500 a month salary from the charity after he was terminated by Ben Zobrist as director of the charity. So there was mismanagement of funds, um, there was a very expensive retirement party, which caused a lot of embarrassment to Ben and, and the, the facts of that um, we can dive into later. But then further, I think one of the more interesting parts of this fraud claim is that we're talking about a major league baseball player who quit most of his 2019 season. And when you just leave your baseball team, you don't have a lot of guaranteed pay. So they prorated his pay for that year. And he, and he lost out on something like $8 million in salary because he was working on his marriage. At the time, he did not know that his wife was having a full-blown affair with the pastor. Um, at the same time, we see Ben consulting with Pastor Jan, not knowing that the pastor is sleeping with his wife or having an affair with his wife. And the pastor and Juliana urge Ben to return to Major League Baseball, even though the pastor and Juliana knew that, that they were having an extramarital affair. And so I think part of also this $6 million uh, lawsuit against Pastor Jan brought by Ben is about some of the misrepresentations made, um, intentional infliction of emotional distress, which is a really fancy term for, you did something that caused me so much you know, mental pain and anguish that I won't be able to recover to my daily everyday self. 
And I think that if, if I'm reading the tea leaves of the pleadings and the briefs, um, to me, I think part of the misrepresentation and fraud claim also has to do with the fact that Juliana and Pastor Jan were trying to convince Ben to go back to play Major League Baseball, which he did for a period of time, potentially so that they could reap the benefit of that contract from the um, Major League, from, from the team, the Chicago Cubs at the time, and have more money in the estate potentially to divide up in a future divorce. So it's so interesting because, you know, going back to what you said at the very top of all that is the fraud really comes down to money right? The fraud. So people, I just want listeners to hear at the very top of what we're talking about here. This is not about some sort of moral um, finding that one of the spouses uh, had an affair and therefore is going to get punished within the divorce context, which is what I think so many people think is happening here. They're like, shame, shame. You did something you're not supposed to do and you're going to get punished for it. That is not at the basis of this legal action that we see playing out here. And it's not at the basis as much as people would like it to be at the basis of almost any divorce case where an affair has happened, which is, as you and I both know, really common. Exactly. And that is the hardest time I, I spend the most time with potential clients on this topic, because most of the time, that is the very reason why people are in your office is because of that betrayal. But for the most part, as the divorce plays out, that is not the main focus. And so in this case, we've got the extramarital affair, that's true, but it really has to do with the money spent during the affair, on the affair, because of the affair. And that's really what, how you can tie in an affair and divorce to um, fraud, is if money has been spent on the girlfriend, on the boyfriend, in the course of hiding this, this affair, if money, significant money, I should say. If significant money has been spent um, on the affair, then the court cares. And only so far as we can try to get the money back into the estate or to make it right financially between the parties. The courts do not care uh, about the emotional toll. They recognize it, they honor it, but there's not uh, you know, some legal positioning that occurs because an affair has happened because it is so common. It's exactly yeah. right. Well, and it's an interesting thing because I'm, I'm breaking down in my mind some of the financial aspects you talked about. And so the $30,000 retirement party, I've heard that one in, I think it's mentioned in every single article I've ever read on this case. And I $30,000 for a party, it, it must have been a nice party. Um, but so what are we talking about there? Are we talking about Ben gets $30,000 if it turns out that that was true, that that was spent fraudulently? What is the, how does that get recovered in the divorce action? I think that now that this divorce has played out and the timing of this podcast occurs after the bench trial, which I think is helpful, we find that Ben has really um, retracted his $6 million lawsuit against the pastor. I suspect that it might have had to be with the fact that maybe the pastor had uh, returned the, the checks that he might have cashed at the time he was terminated. So there might have been some um, curing of the error there, at least the, the most um, significant one, because intentional infliction of emotional distress is so hard to prove uh, and so difficult. And I do think, it, uh, I do think that this, um, the attorney for Pastor Yon had a significant point that this clearly lawsuit does look like it's designed to punish, that it's really all about the emotions of the divorce and the betrayal. And then he's just, you know, being a legal bully by suing the person that had an affair with his wife. Um, but to answer your question, really, I think that um, in the beginning, when we didn't know the involvement of Pastor Yon in the charity, and we didn't know the involvement of Pastor Yon, Yon in the party's finances, because some of these couples really get tied up in the church and their finances get tied up in the church. And we see sometimes these pastors coming into a role of a financial advisor in some, in some ways. So I was really watching this case uh, about six months ago, thinking about, oh no, if this is a pastor that's tied up in the financial affairs of this part of these parties, this might really have some fraud teeth in it. And the reason for our viewers and our listeners is that, you know, if you've got a person who is fraudulently deceiving um, ben Zobrist and funneling money from his estate into his own pockets or into, um, you know, separate accounts or making financial transactions that Ben doesn't agree to, then you've really got a, a big fraud problem. But I don't think that that played out. 
And that's why I think we're seeing this really come down to Ben Zobrist is asking for more of the financial assets because of the affair, because of the money that was spent, yes, by his wife, but in a way he didn't agree with and, and on uh, the person she was having an affair with. I think that's how we're seeing it play out. And Susan, doesn't that match what we know about divorce, which is that really all these outside lawsuits don't uh, aren't as strong as the one of the divorce where you funnel all of your complaints, all of your grievances and all of your issues into your request of the court, your so what? So, I, so Ben Zobrist is saying, because of all of this, I'm gonna drop my lawsuit against this guy, but I want a majority of the estate because they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars um, either together or for each other. I think he's arguing that his wife spent a lot of money on clothing and her physical appearance because of the affair. And so he's asking to recoup that money. And then alternatively, Julianne is asking the court to award her 50% of the estate plus $4 million because he didn't go back to work like she asked him to because he was so upset about the breakdown of his marriage, which I think is an interesting claim. That and, and that's where I was going next. So I'm so glad you brought it up because I have to tell you as an attorney, I was like, wow, this is an interesting little legal, you know, maneuver here on the part of, I do not think that Juliana Zobris probably sat down in her living room one day and said, oh, this is what I'm going to ask for. I think this is her attorneys, like came up with a legal argument that, you know, when Ben did not go back to work for the um, Cubs in the end, at the end of 2019 and forfeited 8 million in salary, she's now asking for 4 million of that as, as lost monies that he could have earned. So let's dive into that because I, from a legal perspective, I find it in, an interesting argument. Yes. And I'm going to be funny about this. I think it's a pretty rich argument to make, <laughs> in my opinion. There you so go. I always like to ask myself, you know, as a divorce lawyer, you have to have credibility when you are persuading the court to go your way. Um, you really have to have a lot of credibility. So when we break down Juliana's credibility in this argument, and I agree with you, this is completely her attorneys trying to, and it could, you know, if this isn't exactly what she wants, and maybe her attorneys don't think this is necessarily going to be a slam dunk win for her, at the very least, it has nuisance value, doesn't it? It has the ability to make his attorneys be stressed. It has them consider what if she's right? What if that small percentage chance the court goes her way. And I, I think that might be for settlement reasons, which obviously that ship has sailed, I suppose, as they're waiting for the, um, the ruling to come down, I think in January. Um, but really, I think it's a rich argument. And here's why. If Juliana, and she knows what she did, she has admitted in this case that she was having an affair. She knows she was having an affair at the time that her husband had to leave the, his um, major league baseball position, which is a high intense sport. It's a mental game. And I know that $8 million seems like quite a bit of money for you know everyday people, for you and I, um, but that is really a drop in the bucket of what these you know, players get paid annually and over time. And I, I think it is reasonable to have a person who's going through a breakdown of their religious marriage um, to, to step away from work. We've all seen in COVID um, how we need to take care of our mental health, how important it is for us to process information and how difficult it is to work when you're going through something difficult. So Ben Zobrist, I don't think is any different. What's interesting is that his wife is making uh, a claim that he should have gone back um, even though she was having the affair and that he should have made the estate more money. So to me, the credibility there for her is lost in my part on that issue because it seems really money hungry. Um, if you're married to a major league baseball player, you have to at some sense know that the money train's going to end in a period of time, either due to injury or age. And the average amount of time a person's in the major leagues or in professional sports is, a, is very small comparatively. So there's no right, I think, that Juliana has to getting millions of money at the time that she's sleeping with a a different person and hiding that fact. So if I were advising her, I would have really cut losses. The estate is what it is. You're having the affair, you admit it, you apologize for it, you understand that it's wrong and you cut your losses at that and ask for as much of the estate as you can get away with instead of you know, this, this argument of how dare you not continue and be the workhorse for our family so that I could continue living in this house, have this farm and engage in this affair. 
So that, you know, I have a strong opinion about it uh, as a litigator and I'm curious to know what you think. Yeah, no, and I, I have to say if, if I, you know, were advising in that case, I might have hesitated to suggest that um, particular course of action because I would say it's where I see the most outrage whenever this case is discussed. Um, it seems to be for at least the public, and I can only imagine what Ben and his counsel felt when that pleading came in. Um, but you know, it it does feel like a money grab. However, I do suspect that, just as you said, um, I thought the minute I saw it that this is sort of a he's got a claim for sixty percent. Uh, you know, based on waste of of marital you know assets. Um, so we need something to counter it. And so they they came up with, I think all they had, you know, they, right. they got creative here. Um, and what people need to understand that you and I know is that is part of how the legal game is played. That's how the litigation train rolls. Um, not everything that gets pled in court is you know rock solid um i'm not in any way implying that there's not a legal basis for this it'll be interesting uh but it, it's going to be difficult and i think it exposed her in an already vulnerable state you know she was vulnerable because particularly within the christian community having an affair is one thing having an affair with the pastor oh i know really just took this to another level. So she was already vulnerable to criticism and derision and all the other things I'm, I'm sure, and you can see in the news that she's put, she's been subject to, and this just took it to another level. Um, you know, if I were, I think it's interesting, if I were making a prediction, you know, about this case, and we'll see in January, and right now I'm going to ask you, will you come back when the decision comes out? Because I want to talk about this when we see it. Absolutely. And I'll make some predictions at the end and we'll see if I'm right. I might yeah. be right. I might be wrong, but absolutely. I'd be happy to. Well, that'll be fun. We'll both be able to talk about what we thought would happen and then we'll yeah. see what actually happens. The other thing that, that people should know is it may not come down to a decision. It has, it, it is not unheard of that settlements happen before the, the True. judicial decision is, you know, put out. Um, some people will do that. It hasn't happened yet. So um, you know, the case has been, the trial has been over now for over a month. So I, if I were going to see it, I would have thought we'd have seen it by now, but you never know. Um, sure. You know, so one of the things that I was, I was thinking of um, in this space is, do you think when a decision comes out or when there's a settlement that it it's, well, let's talk about your predictions. I guess that's really where I'd yeah. want to go. Okay. You know, I think this case, when it first came out into the press, when we first read about it, it had the potential to really be a significant fraud case, like I said. Um, but I don't think the facts are really there, in my opinion, that um, there's been a major element of fraud on the part of the pastor. I think what we're talking about is that wife spent money forwarding the affair or, you know, at a time where she was having the affair that the husband now is, you know, very upset about. But I think it's only like $169,000, which is a lot of money, but it's a small percentage of the overall total of these parties' multi-million dollar estate. And so I'm looking at a complaint about overspending of $169,000. I kind of want to roll my eyes a little bit when I look at parties who are millionaires who are complaining about those dollars and cents. I advise my clients really not to do that. Um, and really we're talking about big picture items instead of, you know, the smaller details, but we've got a, you know, a complaint about $170,000 or so. And then we've got the, the retirement party uh, of $30,000. Um, and then we've got both Ben and Juliana complaining about whether or not he should have or shouldn't have gone back at a time where the money's gone. He's not going to get that $8 million from the Cubs. It's long gone. Juliana's pleadings have already claimed that he's you know, got some mental health issues, which I don't think helps her argument that he should have gone back, right? That that no. only just, you know, you just shot yourself in the foot there, in my opinion, legally, her attorneys did. I'm sure she that was not her strategy. Um, so that's really inconsistent. So to answer your question, I predict that this is going to come down to, I don't think Julian is going to get her 4 million. I think she might get a couple more assets that might be valued a little bit more than, um, than what Ben was valuing, because obviously there's such a big difference in what he 
you know, could potentially earn, although he's done with baseball. So I don't think we're going to see a big swing in her favor just because I don't think he's going to make any more money. I think this is all that he's got. Um, and I believe in when he says his baseball career is over, because I don't think he can just hop right back into, you know, that level of professional sports. Um, I think it's going to come down to a slight disproportionate division in favor of Ben Zobrist, but I don't think it's going to be 60%. I bet it's going to be somewhere closer to, you know, 52% or so. I think that they're probably going to get a 50-50 custody split without her as just primary uh, of the kids um, because he's got nothing but time now, right? Yeah. So, yeah, that was pretty smart. He's it's retired. A, yeah. Right. It's a pretty clever move to be like, oh, oops, you know, the, the life you led and I led that caused us to have all this money and led to your affairs is now over. And that includes you assuming I'm not going to be around for the kids because here I am. So I think it's going to be a 50-50 split of custody. I think he's going to get slightly disproportionate, but certainly not uh, in the way that he's asking for currently. And I bet she'll be awarded some of the, the more cash heavy assets or more valuable assets that, that she could do something with. That's my prediction. Yeah. So I, I think you are spot on. I have to tell you, you, yeah, you could have been speaking for me um, because I, I, I didn't know the dollar value on the, what he's alleging was spent outside or out of the marital funds. But I, I really sort of see it as he'll, they'll get an equal split of the assets, 50, 50 split of the assets, but then he'll get something fed back to his side to, you know, for that waste, for that, um, you know, because we see that. And, you know, I, I, my listeners have heard me talk about the case where I had one client who went on a spending spree buying his new Paramour Chanel bags and mink coats and Mercedes Benzes and all that money went back, you know, to the wife. Um, And that's, what's going to happen here. If the court finds that those monies were spent, but you're a hundred percent correct, right? $200,000 when you're talking about 28 to 30 some odd million dollars in the grand scheme of things, I just don't see it. And I, I, I question, and I just want to sort of raise this to this higher level again. I think they both lost by taking this to trial. Um, I think that this is a case that one another reason why it's it's been so salacious is because it has played out like this and i think it's ben's i'm not saying he doesn't have a right to have his hurt feelings and his anger and his upset but i think that's what drove this into a courtroom and i think they're both going to lose and unfortunately i think their children lose by having this played out the way that it has because ultimately I can only guess what the attorneys have made off this case but i i got a good idea um And that could have stayed uh, there. Neither one of them is going to benefit and their children aren't going to benefit in the end. I couldn't agree with you more. And this is one thing that I really urge both my clients and the people that I speak to when I speak on these topics is that if you are not addressing your divorce in an emotionally intelligent way, which means you're able to set aside or at least, you know, honor your emotions, but don't bring them into your, you know, business meeting about your business divorce and your financial future. And when you're unable to really separate your emotions from your your business mind, when you're making these really high level business decisions, not only about your financial well-being, but about the, like the future lives of your children. And if everything that you are bringing into those decision-making moments is about being a victim, even if you legitimately are, Um, But if you're bringing into that mindset, your victimhood, your anger, your resentment, your rage, then you are hurting yourself because you're unable to strategize and maximize your financial settlement. And you're exactly right. These cases that go to trial, never mind the long march and the calendar, right? Towards from beginning a trial to end, especially now in COVID times, you're talking about years plural. Um, but you know, the, the, the attorneys that are driving that as well. One thing I have found in this case though, that resonates with my practice is that sometimes there are, we live in a world that's both a legal world and the outside world, right? You and I can switch between both. Most people come into a legal world and they learn a whole new set of rules that are different than what they worked, you know, that they thought were the rules in their everyday lives. Now we've got a third layer and that's the religiosity here. It's the religious piece 
that I think their religious community has a different set of rules at times than everyday life and legal world. So I don't know how much of that is driving the emotions of Ben Zobrist, but I suspect that it's, it's a big critical part of it. And, and as much as you have your faith and as much as that drives your morality and the laws that you live by, sometimes those rules don't exist in the legal world. And I think Ben's going to see that as it plays out um, when he gets that ruling. But you're right, Susan, this is avoidable. And high conflict cases are really damaging to the parties involved. But most importantly, the kiddos. We haven't heard a single thing about these three kids, have we? No. No. The only, I mean, if you go look throughout all of this, um, at all of the media, all of everything, you're going to rarely see them even mentioned other than that these two people have three young children. But forever and ever, all that media that's out there, all of these court records that are public record, those children are going to have access to that. The world they live in has access to that. And they're going to live in a world where everybody knows their family's business and has yeah. opinions. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate. It, it truly is. And avoidable. You know, those were choices made by the parents. I know that attorneys drive a lot of decision-making, but at the end of the day, I do not have the right to make the decision. I give the legal advice. I tell them which route they should go, but they make the final decision. And this is on Ben and Julianne at the end of the day, you're right. You know, there's going to be a high school teacher that's read all of this. There's going to be a bully that's read this. There's going to be a girlfriend of the child that's read this. How can I trust you if your mom, you know, all of these things. Um, so most of the time when you have these multi-million dollar cases, we see a lot of these cases being litigated by private judges. These are out of the um, common filings, right? They're filed under a pseudonym or different name for this very reason. And even though wealthy people have just as many issues and problems and dramas as non-wealthy people, uh, you know, we're finding that these high profile cases can be taken out of the public realm if people just think about it a little bit further than their hurt feelings right when they find out that someone's breaking up with them. Yeah. Right. And yes, I, and I, you know, I think that that really says it all right there. And the idea that those hurt feelings can drag out for three years, four years and five years and fuel a litigation like this or some of the other cases. It, it's just really usually unusual because although in the beginning days of, of, of relationship breaking up, that emotion's high, most people start to come down from that level of anger and all, not this case, unfortunately. So it'll be interesting. January's coming. This, this episode's airing in November. Um, so I hope to see you back in January. We're going to go through our predictions then and see how it all comes out. But Holly, thank you so much. Cause I think that this is, it's an important episode um, because the emotions of betrayal and breach of trust and anger and all that, that's so, that's universal. That's common. Um, it, we don't often see it played out at this level. So there's, there are lessons to be learned here. Thank you so much for joining me. It was a pleasure, Susan. Thanks for having me. So how can people get in touch with you? Um, what's the best way? They can go to my website at uh, www.kirkerdavis.com. That's K-I-R-K-E-R davis.com. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. We've got all sorts of ways to get in touch with us on the website um, and check our law firm out. It's Kirker Davis in Austin, Texas. In Austin, Texas. And I will link to that in the show notes. And you have a wonderful free ebook for people. Can you tell them about that? That's right. We've got a lot of information that if you want to download on our website, you don't need to get in touch with an attorney. You might not need to talk to one at all, but we want to give you as much information as you can about the process of divorce and what to be prepared for and thinking about. So we've got several eBooks and blog posts for you to look at uh, that we think are really, really helpful, whether or not you contact an attorney or not, you at least get the information you need. I love that. I love professionals who support people in this really difficult time. So again, Holly, thank you so much for joining me and I'll see you again in January. I'm looking forward to it. 